Okay, good morning everyone again. This is uh, Dan Brown. I'm a senior hurricane specialist at the National Hurricane Center. I'm joined this morning by a distinguished panel of folks that are going to uh, talk to you about hurricanes this morning. And there's going to be an opportunity uh, to for you all to ask us questions. And you'll do that by entering your questions in the question box uh, that you should see on your um, uh, panel there. Uh, you, we can't hear you ask the questions, but if you type those questions in, uh, actually, Andy and I are going to be answering some of those questions during the webinar. And then uh, as we uh, get toward the end, we hope to leave about 30 minutes to be able to really uh, answer all the questions. We actually found uh, uh, this morning that we have more panelists than we do windows on the screen. So you'll hear from someone in a minute that you don't see, and we'll have to uh, uh, switch off and on who our webcams uh, can show. But again, we're all going to be on this morning. So, uh, John, if you can pass me over to the, uh, the next slide. Uh, we'll get started here right away. And that, uh, you know, uh, folks in, in Florida have certainly uh, seen our fair share of hurricanes. We all, uh, I think all of us on here live in Florida. So uh, we're residents of the state and uh, we're experienced with hurricanes in Florida. Unfortunately, is no stranger to uh, hurricanes. Uh, if we go all the way back to uh, Andrew back in uh, 1992, that was a category five hurricane that struck South Florida. And then I uh, moved here about a year later, so I have memories of a lot of these storms uh, that you see on the screen, including Wilma, and then Charlie back in 2004, and then more recent storms like Matthew, Michael, and Irma all have created uh, you know, havoc and, and some devastation in the state, unfortunately. But we're gonna learn about these hurricanes, how we forecast them, and what the hazards are. So let me introduce the panelists on the next uh, slide here. And, uh, uh, we again have uh, a lot of folks uh, joining us today to help with uh, with those questions you're going to ask us. Uh, so uh, Robbie's going to uh, join us for the second half of the, the uh, presentation today. Uh, we have Nikki, a very distinguished person uh, that helps fly, uh, collect data uh, as they fly into hurricanes. She works for uh, NOAA's Aircraft Operations Center up in Lakeland, Florida. So we're so happy to have Nikki on today. Again, myself, I'm Dan Brown. Uh, John Cangelosi, who you don't see, I'm going to pass it to him in just a minute. He's going to take us through the first part of the presentation. Uh, and then we have Paxson from the National Weather Service office in Miami, uh, here in South Florida. Uh, and then also Jen, who works for the National Weather Service office in Tampa. Both of them are going to talk about what they do at the local forecast offices and how we work as a partnership when there's a hurricane threatening with the Hurricane Center providing the forecast and those uh, folks providing those that local information. And then lastly, I have help here with Andy, who's going to help moderate our question and answer session with me. We're also going to be trying to answer some of those questions you ask in that question box during the webinar. So keep those questions coming. But we have a lot of folks on today. I know we won't get to all the questions today, but we'll try to get to as many as we can. So with that, I'm going to send it right over to John. I'm going to uh, uh, turn off my webcam, John, so you can turn yours on and then uh, let you start the presentation. So thanks again, everybody, for joining us this morning. All right, well, good morning, everybody. I'm gonna turn on my webcam so you can see me as I talk. Uh, nice, thank you so much for joining us, as Dan said. Hopefully, you're excited to learn a little bit about hurricanes today. We are certainly excited to be here to teach you a little bit about hurricanes and our jobs. But before we talk about hurricanes, I got a question for everybody. Do you know what a meteorologist is? Now, when a lot of people think of a meteorologist, they sort of picture someone on television telling them what the weather is going to be like for the day. And that could be a meteorologist, but a meteorologist is really someone who studies or forecasts the weather. So we have a whole variety of jobs in meteorology. The bottom line for everybody listening, if you have a fascination about the weather, and you have strong math and science skills, I think you have what it takes to be a future meteorologist. So keep that in mind if you sort of find this stuff interesting and ask all the questions you want today. Well, as Dan mentioned, we're gonna try to get to as many as we can. Now we wanna spend some time talking to you about what we do at the National Hurricane Center. So we're in your state, everybody. Greetings from Miami. We're located on the Florida International University about 10 miles west of downtown Miami. Of course, we're not in the building today. I wish we could be there showing you around, but hopefully this is the next best thing. Here's a couple of pictures of our building from the outside. And you might say, well, that's not very pretty looking. And I would agree. 
but I will tell you that the building is very, very strong. It's made of concrete and steel. And the whole idea here is, is that we can stay working in that building regardless if a hurricane comes to South or not. Now at the National Hurricane Center, we have a really big job. We're forecasting for tropical storms and hurricanes over a really large area from basically near Africa, all the way across the Atlantic Basin into the Pacific Ocean, pretty close to Hawaii. So a really large area that we cover, not just for the United States. Now, in addition to forecasting hurricanes, we also tell boaters, big ships, and other people who spend time on the ocean what the weather's going to be like. So if you go on a cruise or you go out fishing, deep sea, or if you know someone I think we may have lost John. You want to get it, Robbie, since you have it pulled up? Yeah, sorry, everybody. Stand by. We're going to pull up uh, my slides here and continue moving. Give us one second. Okay. Everybody see my slides? Yep. Okay. So as John was talking about, you know, the Hurricane Center, we also uh, give weather forecasts to people who are out in the ocean. So if you're on a cruise ship, on a yacht, or even if people you know that work on oil rigs, such as out in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, the people there need, need to know the weather. What's the weather going to be like uh, as they are out on the water? So uh, we also provide uh, that type of information as well. Now, you may have heard of the National Weather Service. So the National Weather Service, obviously, is, is a government agency. We forecast weather for the entire country. So where are we located? Well, funny enough, we're actually everywhere. If you look at this map, you can see that everywhere in the country is covered by a National Weather Service office. So that's why we're lucky today to have Jen and Paxton with us because they each work at one of these local National Weather Service offices in the state of Florida. So I'm gonna first uh, pass it to Jen, who's gonna talk about her job at the National Weather Service office in Tampa Bay. Yeah, so um, I work at the National Weather Service office in Tampa Bay. Uh, we are located actually in Ruskin, Florida, which is in um, the Southern part of the Tampa Bay area. Um, so we forecast just for 15 counties in West Central and Southwest Florida. Um, far up north in uh, the Suwannee River is our northern border in Levy County. And then all the way down to the south in um, Lee County, which is the Fort Myers area. And as far inland as uh, Polk County, which has uh, Lakeland and Lake Wales. Um, and then we also forecast the coastal waters out 60 nautical miles uh, from the coast. And we do everything from both the uh, local effects of hurricanes uh, to aviation weather, fire weather, mm -hmm. uh, marine forecasts, and the everyday forecasts we're used to hearing for uh, rain chances and temperatures and highs mm -hmm. and lows and all that. So that's what we do here at the Tampa office. Thanks, Jen. Uh, and then Paxton uh, is from the National Weather Service office in Miami, and uh, we'll let her talk a little bit about her job there. Yeah, so we're just pretty similar to what Jen's been saying in terms of duties such as aviation, fire, marine, things like that. Um, but but on down in Miami, we actually have both coasts. So we have 60 nautical miles offshore the Atlantic, the East Coast for the Atlantic waters, and also the West Coast for the Gulf waters. And we have seven counties that we forecast for, that we issue warnings for. On, on, when it comes to hurricanes, we co coordinate with the National Hurricane Center, but we're one of the lucky offices where we are actually co-located with the Hurricane Center. So that picture on the top left, the same exact building that John was showing you on one of the earlier slides, same building, we're co-located with them. Um, for the most part, it's, it's pretty empty nowadays. Uh, on the forecast office side, only the operational staff is is allowed in there, whether cooperating, of course, 
So that way we're still able to get out your forecast, issue warnings, uh, issue advisories, whatever it may be. Um, but I mean, the good thing for, for Florida anyways, is that it has many different schools if you're interested in meteorology, such as Florida State, University of Miami, Florida International University, which is where we're located. And those are just a few. So, I mean, I think Jen covered most of what we what we do in Florida. Yeah, thanks, Paxton. So yeah, those are just two of the offices within Florida. There are other offices as well in Key West, Melbourne, uh, Jacksonville, Tallahassee, and also the Mobile, Alabama office covers a part of the Western Canyon. So, our state is covered by a lot of different local weather offices that provide the forecasts to you. So let's talk a little bit more about actual hurricanes now. So what you're seeing on your screen is a satellite picture of a hurricane that happens to hit the coast of Texas a couple of years back. This is Hurricane Harvey uh, that hit Texas a few years ago. So what do you notice when you watch this satellite image? You probably see the clouds in white, but what do you notice in the center of this image? You see how there's kind of this hole, but there's not that many clouds? Well, that's what we call the eye of the hurricane. And when you're in the eye of the hurricane, the winds are actually pretty calm, or at least light. So while we always think about storms and these hurricanes causing a lot of wind and a lot of rain, when you're in the center of the eye, there really is not much weather. It's usually very calm. You look up at the sky, and sometimes you can see blue skies. So you know, this is one particular hurricane that hit Texas, and every hurricane is going to be different, but in most cases, these well-defined hurricanes are going to have these eyes where the weather is pretty calm. Now, away from the eye, you get other weather where you can get a very heavy rainfall from the outer rain bands of the hurricane, and you can kind of notice that here in the satellite image that away around the eye, there's all this thunderstorm activity uh, where you're getting this other hazardous weather. So how do we group hurricanes? You've probably often heard that we call hurricanes by category one or category three or even category five. Well, we do that because we categorize or group hurricanes based on what are the strongest winds within that storm. And these two men that you see on the screen here, Herb Saffer and Robert Simpson, uh, they were each an engineer and a meteorologist. And they teamed up several decades ago to try and figure out, okay, how can we group these hurricanes based on the type of wind that they have and the kind of damage that they may cause. And so that's what we now have is the Saffir Simpson Hurricane Wind Scale, where we categorize storms as category one if the winds are 74 to 95 miles per hour, all the way up to category five if the winds are 157 miles per hour or stronger. So that's where, if you hear these numbers, one through five, that's where this comes from. It's the grouping of these hurricanes based on the wind speeds in the storm and the type of damage that they might occur or that they might cause. Now, anytime you get a storm that's category three, four, or five, that's what we call a major hurricane. So where do major hurricanes actually occur in the Atlantic Ocean? So what you're looking at here now is a map of all the hurricanes, the major hurricanes that have occurred over the Atlantic Ocean, and those are shown by the yellow lines. So what do you notice in this diagram? You probably see that there are a lot of yellow lines, especially in the, in the western or left-hand side of that image. So you know, unfortunately for the United States and some of our surrounding countries, major hurricanes happen often. We have to be prepared for these really strong storms because they can hit Florida and cause not just strong winds, but all the other hazards that come with these storms. And we're going to talk about those hazards here coming up in a bit. So but if we zoom in a little bit closer to Florida itself, because that's where we all live, look at all the hurricanes that have hit the state since 1900. There's so many storms that have hit Florida since that year that it's almost hard to see the state on this map. Uh, the concentration of the storms is so thick that uh, the state is almost being covered up. Uh, but what you notice here is that the colors show the category of the storm. So yellows would be category one, all the way up to those kind of purple colors would be categories four and five. So you can notice that there are parts of the state that have also been hit by these major hurricanes, especially in the southern part of the state, and then even more recently in the panhandle, such as Hurricane Michael, which hit uh, a couple of years ago. That was a category five Atlanta. So Again, Florida is one of the most susceptible states in the country when it comes to seeing these very strong storms. So guess what? It's pop quiz time. So uh, we weren't going to let you get off uh, 
watching this webinar without having to do a little, a little bit of work, but we promise this is gonna be fun. So we have a quick question for you. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna actually let you vote on your screen. I'm gonna uh, ask the question, go through the answers, and then Dan is gonna open up the poll so that you can vote on this question. Here it is. When is the Atlantic hurricane season? Is it A, May through November? B, December through April? C, June through November? or D all year long. So Dan, I'm gonna pass it to you to open up the poll. Thanks, I know folks can't see me at the moment, but uh, I do have the poll open and you should see it on your screen. Lots of folks are uh, voting. And those votes are coming in really quickly. More than half of you have voted, now more than two thirds have voted. So I'm gonna leave it open for a few more seconds to see if we can get those final votes in. And I think I will go ahead and close the poll now. And let me see if I can share those results. If you can see those, uh, about two thirds of the people that answered uh, selected June through November, and another quarter of the folks selected May through uh, November. So 90% either selected uh, May through November or June through November. So Robbie, I'll let you, uh, I'll let you uh, tell them the answer. Great, so here's the answer, folks. It is C, June through November. So it looks like the majority of you guys were correct in that hurricane season begins June 1st and it ends November 30th. Now, if you selected the answer that was May through November, you're not too far off. In fact, almost, seems like recently especially, we've had a lot of storms that have formed even in the month of May. So while the official start of the season is June 1st, we even have to be concerned about possible storms forming in the month of May, especially here in Florida because the waters of the Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean, they're already starting to get warm and we can see storms form before the official start of the season. So great job, everybody. Uh, really proud that you answered that question correctly. So here it is, uh, June 1st to November 30th is when we typically say is the official hurricane season, even though we can occasionally have a storm before June 1st or even occasionally storms after November 30th. Uh, this is one snapshot of a, of a uh, satellite image of the Atlantic Ocean back in 2018. In fact, this was September 11th, 2018. What do you notice on this slide? Well, when I look at this slide, I see one, two, three, four, and even a fifth patch of clouds over here. We had four to five storms ongoing in the Atlantic at one time, at this time in uh, September 2018. So. At this time, you know, we can we can have some very busy hurricane seasons where we have a lot of storms going on at the same time, and we're having to put out forecasts for all these storms at the same time. So it can get quite busy. And you'll notice that with this image that I have on the screen now, we call this our campfire diagram because it looks like a fire if you were to go out camping. Uh, and what it's showing you is that when does the activity in the Atlantic heat up? When do we see the most hurricanes? And you can see that the top of this little fire here is about September 10th. So that's when we typically tend to see the busiest time of year. September 10th is when we see the most hurricanes, possibly all at once. Uh, we often say that as you get to the months August, September, and then October, that's when you tend to see the most storms. And that's when you have to be most prepared, especially in the state of Florida. So again, the season starts June 1st, ends November 30th, but most of the activity is in these three months of August, September, and October. So time for another quiz. Now we're not gonna open the poll for this one. We just want you to think about this one in your head or even scream out the answer out loud if you'd like. Uh, tell your parents what you think the answer is. Here it is. What are the primary hurricane hazards? Is it A, high winds, B, storm surge, C, heavy rainfall, D, dangerous surf, or E, all of the above? I'll give you a moment to, again, think about it in your head or scream it out loud. So the answer to this one is actually E, all of the above. All of those things that you see there, the winds, the storm surge, the rainfall, and the surf, those are all things that come with hurricanes. Those are all things that we have to be ready for if a hurricane was to hit uh, where we live. So 
all of the above is the correct answer. Now, you're probably looking at that slide saying, well, how am I going to remember all those things? I mean, that's a lot of different things that come with these storms. Well, I think we have an easy way for you to remember them. So I want you to remember this word. It's SWIFT, S-W-I-F-T. And for each of these letters, that'll help you to remember one of the hurricane hazards that we just talked about. So S stands for storm surge. And we're going to talk a little bit more about these hazards here as we uh, move ahead, but I just want to show you a quick picture of what they look like. Storm surge is when the ocean comes onto land. The wind from the storm is actually pushing the ocean water onto normally dry land. So as you can see in that picture there, those houses and that car, uh, they shouldn't be sitting in water. But because of the hurricane, in this case, the water from the ocean came onto land and it flooded both the vehicle and those homes. Now the W in SWIFT stands for wind. And this is what most people think about when we talk about hurricanes. They think about the wind and the damage that the wind can cause to homes or, or knocking down trees. Um, and that's also obviously an important part of hurricanes, but it's not the only thing that we have to be worried about. Now the I and the F in SWIFT are actually combined because they stand for inland flooding. So it's not just the ocean water that we're concerned about, but it's water that also falls from the sky. As you can imagine, you get a lot of rainfall in these hurricanes and even tropical storms and tropical depressions. It can cause a lot of rainfall, and when that rain doesn't have anywhere to go after it falls, it can flood uh, homes and businesses and vehicles as well. So we have to be concerned about inland flooding. Lastly, the, last, the T in SWIFT stands for tornadoes. So you often probably think about tornadoes as occurring out in the Great Plains of the United States or the Southeast. I know even yesterday there was a tornado or two that occurred in parts of central Florida just from some severe weather. Well, we can actually get tornadoes in hurricanes as well. Now they don't normally occur within the eye wall of the hurricane. That's where the strongest winds occur. But they often occur in the outer rain bands that are kind of out on the sides of the hurricane. So Again, it's, these hurricanes come with a multitude of different hazards and they can occur in different parts of the storm itself. Now there's one other hazard that we have to touch on that's not included in this swift word, and that's waves and rip currents. So the hurricanes can cause the ocean to get pretty angry and those waves can crash onto the beach, onto the shore, uh, and then they can cause rip currents at the beach as well. So we have to be also concerned with not going to the beach when the waves are really strong, really high, because unfortunately that can pull you back out into the ocean, and we don't want that to happen. So uh, these are all the hazards that can occur with these storms, and we have to be concerned with all of them. Okay, we've got one more pop quiz question, and we are going to open the polls for this one. There you go. It's which hurricane hazard has caused the most deaths in the United States? Is the answer A, wind? B, storm surge, C, flooding, or D, tornadoes. So I'm going to pass it over to Dan, who's going to open up the poll again. Uh, and then I'm also going to see if John is back on and whether or not he wants to take over the second half of the talk. I am, Robbie, and thank you for coming to my rescue. I had a, my power went out, so I appreciate you helping me. And I can take over if you'd like. Sure. Yeah, why don't you go ahead and take over? Okay, um, I'm watching the uh, results come in, and remember, uh, vote on the, uh, the the poll that you see, not uh, not in a question window. Uh, that way, we'll count your votes here. A lot of folks uh, have already voted. Give it another few seconds. See if we get any final votes. It's a close vote this time. Um, there's uh, uh, three answers that a lot of people are are answering. So it looks like about everybody is finished now. I will go ahead and close it and then try to, do you want me to share that real quick, John, or do you want me to just read you the results? No, go ahead and share it if you'd like, Dan. Okay, um, the results were that uh, about 37% said storm surge, 33% uh, said flooding, and 21% uh, said tornadoes. So 92% uh, said it was either storm surge, flooding, or tornadoes, and only 8% said the wind. So I'll let you give them the answer. Sure. Um, can you get, can you see my screen, Dan? Oh, maybe not yet. Hang on one second. Yeah, I cannot yet. There it is. Okay. Sorry. Right. Well, first I want to apologize earlier, everybody. So my power just went out. It's kind of part of the uh, problems working from home, I assume, or 
that's kind of what happens, I suppose. But the correct answer is everybody. I think we did well here, Dan. The correct answer is the storm surge. That is what we were looking for. Now, I want to run through an exercise with everybody. What most people think of when it comes to hurricane is the wind, right? If you close your eyes and you just ask most people and you just visualize a hurricane, most people just visualize a whole bunch of wind and destruction from the hurricane's winds. But in reality, what is so damaging, what is the big problem, and a lot of you knew, is the water, the water-related hazards. It's what most people don't think about, but it's what most people really should think about. So I challenge you, the next time you hear of a hurricane, think about all those water-related hazards in that word swift that Robbie was talking about. Now, I want to tell you a little bit why water is such a problem. It's really what unfortunately kills the most amount of people. This was a study that we did at the National Hurricane Center years ago. And what we found out is that about nine out of 10 people who dive in hurricanes unfortunately drown in the United States. About half of the total comes from the storm surge flooding. Another big portion, about 27%, dry in the, die in the flooding rains. And then if you add up all of the water-related hazards, just like we talked about, it accounts for about 90%. Yeah, 90% drown in hurricanes. So please don't forget about the water, because the water is really historically the big problem. So let me show you how big of a problem the water could be in hurricanes. Let's head up to New York. Now, I'm sure some of you have been to New York before, so try to visualize what it looks like in the city. Now, here is a street corner in New York that I really want you to focus on. This is what this street corner looked like on just an ordinary day. I want you to see this restaurant here in the corner, take a look at the building above it, and all of the cars. All right. Now I'm going to show you what this street corner looked like when Hurricane Sandy was coming through New York City. Now Hurricane Sandy came through at night, so you're going to get a much darker look. Let's take a look together. Impressive, huh? Here's the restaurant. You can see the water from the storm surge flooding was about halfway. It was coming in to the restaurant. It's about halfway up the police car here and all across about a quarter of the way up the van. Now, everybody, this is storm surge, not flooding rains. This water was coming in off of the New York complex waterways, like rivers and sounds. And you could imagine how gross this was, right? As New York's got all these dirty waterways. This is a huge problem. And as we just mentioned, unfortunately, the deadliest hazard when it comes to hurricanes. Here's another look from Hurricane Sandy in New York. Take a look at these houses here. The storm surge flooding got so high there that it shifted these houses off their foundation and destroyed them, causing such big problems across New York. Now, this could certainly happen in Florida, everybody, especially the west coast of Florida, like the Tampa area, Naples, all the way up to our Appalachian Bay and the Florida Panhandle. Those are some of the most vulnerable spots to storm surge that exist in the country. So we need everybody here to be really smart when it comes to storm surge. And I want you to remember, that's the reason why we evacuate in the United States for hurricanes. It is because of this hazard. All right, switching gears, let's talk about flooding, but not from storm, storm surge, but from the heavy rains. Now, I want you to focus on the highway right here in the middle of the screen. This is what it looks like on an ordinary day, and that's in the Houston, Texas area. Now, you want to see what that highway looked like after a tropical storm, Alliston, a while ago in 2001, basically sat over portions of Texas delivering so much rain. Keep your eyes right here on the middle of the screen. Here's what happened during a tropical storm, not even a hurricane. Wow. Check out the flooding rains. That highway right there in the middle looks more like a river. And you can see these tractor trailers just floating around due to this tremendous rains. This was about 30 or 35 inches of rain that just fell in a few days in Houston. In fact, it got even worse than this during Hurricane Harvey that Robbie showed just a few years ago. And certainly this can happen in our state as well. Tornadoes. Robbie mentioning earlier that if you live in central or northern Florida, you could have seen a tornado yesterday. 
and they can be really a big problem. Now, when it comes to hurricanes, tornadoes are most likely to occur in the hurricane's rain bands, where the winds can be gusty. And these tornadoes can cause local amounts of significant wind damage. So always be alert to these tornadoes as they can cause lots of problems. And if you have interest in tornadoes, make sure to ask questions to Paxton and Jen who are on the line, who will tell you all about how that works. Robbie also mentioned the waves and rip currents. Now, one thing that's pretty amazing with hurricanes is they can produce huge waves. In fact, we've seen reports in hurricanes that the waves can be as high as 50 feet over the deep oceans. Now, you certainly won't get waves like that near the coastline, but the message for everybody is remember, even if a hurricane doesn't directly affect your area, it could still produce really big waves and rip currents along the beaches. So you remember, we need you to stay away from the beaches when the local meteorologists like Jen and Paxton tell you to do so. It could even be a beautiful, beautifully sunny day, but the beaches could be a rough place or a bad place to be. So remember to pay attention to all of these flags and the local meteorologists. So you might say, well, how do, how do we predict the weather and how do we track hurricanes? Well, we make use of lots of different tools and data. We use surface observations from land stations, ships and buoys out at sea. They all report weather information. We also use information from upper air data and weather balloons and even aircraft, yeah, even planes fly into hurricanes. And we're gonna to talk to a special person coming up next about that. We make use of satellites that give us information just like the pictures that Robbie showed earlier. Doppler weather data that you might see on TV or on your phones give us additional information and computer weather models help us predict what's gonna happen in the future. And that's, we use all of these tools. And if you wanna be a meteorologist one day, you'll learn how to use all of this information to do your job. So yeah, I mentioned we fly airplanes into hurricanes. Wanna learn more about that? Let's pass it over to Nikki, who's gonna tell you how she does her job. Can you hear me okay, John? Yeah, I can hear you just well, just fine, Nikki. Okay, awesome. So yes, I'm a flight director with the NOAA Hurricane Hunters, and we also were located in the state of Florida. Actually, in Lakeland, Florida is where our aircraft operations center is. And I fly on both of those aircraft that you see in that picture on the screen there. Um, the one on the left is the G4 aircraft, uh, it's our jet. It flies the highest and the fastest. Um, its name is Gonzo. And the one on the right is one of our P3s. We have two, and uh, we named them Kermit and Miss Piggy. So we name our aircraft. We like to, to give them some names. And these are both um, planes that we use to essentially collect data that then survey uh, the hurricanes. So the picture on the right, the P3 goes through the hurricanes while the G4 jet flies around and above the hurricanes. But both collect vital information that then go into the forecast models that our forecasters, um, like the people you were just speaking to, use to then put together a forecast to keep you safe. Um, so the picture on the right hand side in the bottom there, you see the clouds and then you see bright blue above them. That's actually a picture in the eye of the storm. So that was taken on our P3 aircraft. Uh, so that's in the center of the eye. You can see how it kind of looks like a stadium, right? The white clouds kind of um, shift upwards and they kind of have a sloping look to them. And then above them, it's bright blue. And that's a little bit what Robbie was talking about earlier about how in the eye, it can be bright blue, clear, light wind conditions. So that's kind of a cool picture there. Um, and then the pictures that you see below the aircraft, that's um, our Air Force uh, team out in front of one of their planes, the C-130. Um, I have a friend who works over there and gets to fly through hurricanes with them. Actually, both Paxton and I do. And then that's a picture of me working on processing some of the data that we collect, that we collect through the aircraft and to drop on. Thank you, Nikki. And remember, everybody, if you got questions about what it's like to fly in and over a hurricane, remember to ask Nikki in the question box, and we'll get to it at the end of the webinar. All right, I want to show you just a couple of more things. A big part of our job at the National Hurricane Center is also to communicate. Not only do we want to get the forecast as right as possible, but we try to get the message right to the people. And part of the reason we get the message right is because we know our forecasts are only as good as how people understand it. 
Here's a couple of views from inside the Hurricane Center of us telling people about the forecast, whether on television, radio, newspaper, or social media. So hopefully, if you're watching television, you'll see some of us on television this year, hopefully not for a storm that's affecting Florida though. And I want everybody to get ready for hurricanes. As Robbie said, hurricane season starts June 1. And you might be saying, well, what can I do to get ready? I encourage you to go to the link that you see here on this webpage to figure out everything you can do to get ready for the 2020 hurricane season. I know everybody in Florida is some of the smartest people in the country about hurricanes, but we can all do better. So remember, get ready for June 1, but keep in mind the big storms are probably coming later, but I want everybody to be ready for the start of the hurricane season. All right, with that, I'm going to leave you a couple of websites here for future information to learn more about hurricanes and the National Weather Service and general weather. And I'm going to pass it back to Dan so we can get to some of your questions. Thanks, John. I again, no folks can't see me, but uh, I'm here. And uh, I was going to turn it over to Andy, let him actually uh, ask the first one. I know he's been answering a lot, uh, a lot of great questions. Again, I know we're not going to get to all of them. Uh, but uh, we'll get to as many as we can here for about the next uh, 25 minutes or so. So, Andy? Um, my qu first question here, as a whole bunch of people have been asking uh, some of our questions the last several minutes. Uh, it's for uh, Nikki. Um, is it scary to fly into the eye of a hurricane? And also, um, how many times have you done that? So, that is a great question. So I am actually the newest flight director, so I have not done it nearly as many times as some of my colleagues. Um, so to be exact, only twice. Um, but this hurricane season, if it's active, uh, we will be changing that number. Uh, but it's, it's, I would say if you don't like riding roller coasters, you probably wouldn't like riding through a hurricane. Uh, so a lot of bumps, a lot of, a lot of um, wiggling around in your seat. Um, so you definitely have to have your seatbelt buckled. Um, but we have a great team of people that are flying our aircraft safely and working together to make sure we get through and collect the data in the best and safe way possible. So that's, that's a great question, but that would be my answer. It's not, it's not scary if you like roller coasters. Thanks, Nikki. Um, I'm going to throw one here uh, kind of to the collective group a little bit. Maybe I'll pick on somebody here in a second. Um, but it was a question from Madeline asking, do we all work together? And I'll start with saying the answer is yes, that you know, it takes all of us as a team to really uh, make sure we get that forecast to you at home. Uh, you know, it takes the folks like Nikki to collect the data to help us do the forecasting. But I'll throw it maybe over to Jennifer first and maybe Paxson. But maybe you get a little bit into exactly how you take our information from the Hurricane Center, make the forecast, and then how you have to communicate that with emergency managers and, and how people in, in their local communities can help. And then I'll throw it over to, to Paxson next. But Jennifer. Yeah, so um, in a hurricane situation, you know, we are in um, daily contact with the Hurricane Center via um, video conferencing to make sure that everybody's on the same page as far as what the forecast is going to be uh, for location and intensity and all of that. And then us at the local forecast offices then take that information and then um, transform it into what the impacts are going to be for our local area. So if we know the speed and intensity and where it's going, then we take that and we say, well, we're going to expect this much storm surge in this location and then this much storm surge in this location based off of that forecast. Same with um, rainfall amounts and uh, the probability of tornadoes. And then each forecast office within the, uh, the state, well, anywhere surrounding even, um, are then speaking with each other in the process of doing that to make sure that all of those um, forecasts are also consistent as you go along the coastline as well. So um, I can pass it over to Paxton now and she can expand on that. Yeah, and I was just going to ask maybe Paxton because you, uh, the two offices, uh, Tampa and Miami, have to coordinate sometimes almost every day about general weather. So maybe she wants to talk about how that coordination process works and how you and the other offices in Florida are actually forecasting weather across the state you know, every single day, including today. Yeah, so we pretty much we do collaborate in house with each other. So for us in Miami, uh, the three offices we collaborate with are Tampa, Melbourne, and Key West. 
And a lot of times it could do with, with active weather actually going on. So if, if radar is active, we have some strong storms moving into the area, let's say moving down from Martin County up in Melbourne's uh, warning area, and it's drifting southward into Miami's area, we'll chat back and forth with Melbourne. Uh, so if we have warnings, uh, advisories, whatever it would be, where everybody's on the same page. Because even though there's, there is an imaginary border, a county warning area border between the two offices, the storm's the same. It's not going to hit the border and then magically change all of a sudden. And then we have other impacts we collaborate with as well, such as rip currents. So a lot of times if we're thinking of issuing a high risk of rip currents along, along our west coast for the Collier County beaches, we'll talk to Tampa to see what they're thinking too. Because it, it would look strange if we have a high, Tampa has a low risk or vice versa. So we want to make sure everybody's on the same page. Uh, so it doesn't always have to be collaboration with active weather. It could be just local hazards such as rip currents or even high surf, um, something to do with seas, wells, with the marine zones, things like that. So we take a lot. We, we work together pretty much every single day, whether it's through through the computer via chat or if it's on the phone. And then we also bounce off each other's radars too. Some, we coordinate with radars. So if Tampa takes their sound, we won't take our sound purposely anyway, because they'll use ours if theirs is down and vice versa again. I'm gonna, the next question here, uh, I'm gonna pick on uh, the hurricane specialists in the room. Uh, maybe Robbie. Uh, so I got a question a little earlier on. Um, how did Michael, Hurricane Michael, get so strong so fast? Maybe you can enlighten them how that happened. Yeah, you know, that's an excellent question. In fact, I mean, the, the quick answer is that we're going to have to have a lot of research done on Michael. Because in truth, when we were forecasting Michael days before it hit the Florida panhandle, the atmosphere didn't really look that favorable to allow the storm to strengthen as it did. And so we were a little surprised that as it moved to the Gulf of Mexico, uh, it did that it did strengthen. Now, obviously, the Gulf of Mexico waters, especially in October, are very warm, and that always helps storms to strengthen. But the one particular aspect that we were watching that did not look conducive for strengthening was the wind shear. We were thinking that the wind shear was just going to be way too strong. So what is wind shear? Well, if you think about that in the atmosphere, in the when you look up at the sky, there's winds at all different levels. And wind shear is when the winds are blowing at either different speeds or different directions as you move up into the atmosphere. So in the case of Michael, it looked like that those winds would be getting really strong as you went up into the atmosphere. And hurricanes don't like that type of scenario. So what actually happened with Michael is that the shear did not obviously make it weak. And in fact, the shear was light enough or uh, the wind pattern was just so that it allowed the storm to strengthen. So I wish I had a better answer for you. And at this point, it's kind of still a little bit of a mystery. And that's why we need scientists and other meteorologists who are in the research field to go back and look and see what happened with that storm. Because once we have those answers, that'll help us to be able to get the forecast better and more right for other hurricanes that occur in the future. Thanks, Robbie. Um... I have another question I was going to send to, uh, perhaps I'll send this one to John, another one for one of the NAC folks. Uh, I, I like the question because it, you know, it talks about why is it that the hurricane season uh, begins on June 1st? Why is it in another month? Uh, maybe we can talk a little about some of the ingredients needed for formation. Uh, again, sometimes we do get storms uh, before the hurricane season. Yeah, Dan, that's a really good question. So, you know, Mother Nature doesn't really cooperate on a calendar, so it's a great question in reality. So some of the ingredients needed are these, and Robbie mentioned a couple of them. So warm water, about 80 degrees is sort of the rough estimate of what's needed, a low amount of wind shear, and a high amount of moisture. Those are sort of the three most important things. And what we've noticed is that those generally seem to line up the most where tropical storms and hurricanes form from the months from June through November. Now, it doesn't mean that can't happen in April or May. We've seen it happen in April or May. And it doesn't mean it's impossible to happen in January, February, March, for example. But it just means that the most likely period is June 1 through November 30th. And that's what we've defined as hurricane season. But keep in mind, that's sort of a man-made definition where Mother Nature is going to do what 
whatever it wants to do. And in reality, we've seen a tropical storm or a tropical depression uh, just about in every month of the year. So it's not impossible for it to happen just about at any time. All right, thanks, John. Uh, the next question is kind of a combo question. Uh, uh, I guess I can start off by answering the first part of it. Um, it we've been asked by, uh, how do we get into the weather service? What are the requirements? And why did we get into the weather service? Um, I can tell you the requirements are at least at the minimum is a bachelor's degree in meteorology. And there's a bunch of different places around the country uh, that offer a program in meteorology. A couple of us are here from Florida State. So I'm gonna advertise Florida State, go Knowles. Um, but I, I got into meteorology because I, I liked watching tropical cyclones when I was a kid, seeing them approach the area. And I love the Florida thunderstorms during the summertime. It's during the summertime. It's, it's so cool to watch them form. Um, I'll pass it on to maybe Robbie next to enlighten us on his experience. Yeah, so I, mean, I also got a meteorology degree. I went to North Carolina State University in Raleigh, North Carolina. Um, I got the meteorology degree, but then I also got uh, essentially an oceanography degree in marine science. So for me, I was really interested in what happens at the beach with the ocean. Um, and I thought that meteorology and oceanography, they kind of go hand in hand. It's very talked about hurricanes thrive off the ocean. So you really have to have an understanding of how the ocean works to see how does the storm behave. And then once the storm occurs, what kind of storm surge might you get? That's also oceanography. So for me, it was kind of marrying those two degrees together. Uh, and that's what really, really helped me out in my career. I guess I'll go next. So for me, um, I graduated at the University of Miami. Uh, didn't know I wanted to do hurricanes though right away. I grew up in New York, so I was really interested in snowstorms and wanted to learn more about that. But once I got to South Florida, I think hurricanes just became the most interesting thing. Um, I did get a master's degree also at the school, and that's where I really knew I wanted to do hurricane work. Um, but my advice to everybody listening is that um, if you know you want to be a meteorologist, just really enjoy the weather outside. And Florida is such a cool place to live, to observe and enjoy the weather. And then I think you'll know specifically what you want to study from there. But um, for me personally, I went to the University of Miami and loved tropical weather. Thanks, John. Um, I did see someone, Andy, that said boo to Florida State on the comments. So they, I know others, uh, I yeah. know some others Here's went to different schools, but uh, there, maybe there was a Gator or, or other fans yeah, in here as well. <laughs> uh, but I did see, uh, uh, let's see, I did see a question. Um, I guess I'll turn this maybe back over to Robbie, uh, you know, just talking about, and, and because we're talking to a lot of folks from Florida today, a lot of seen a lot of questions about what state gets the most number of hurricanes. Uh, I think I know that answer, Robbie, but I'll let you talk about that. Yeah, so if you remember earlier in the presentation, we showed the map of Florida and all the hurricane tracks. So unfortunately, we live in the state that gets the most hurricanes. Uh, and that's why I think, though, why all you guys seem so smart about hurricanes and are so well prepared for hurricanes because you know, almost any given year, we can see a storm. It doesn't even have to be a hurricane. It could be a tropical storm. Uh, that causes a lot of rainfall and we're used to that as well so florida is number one on the list we get the most storms uh, number two i think is north carolina if you look at the map of the united states as you go up the east coast north carolina kind of juts out a bit into the atlantic ocean um, and so it kind of gets sideswept and hit by a lot of hurricanes as well so they'd be number two but anywhere along the gulf coast texas louisiana they get hit a lot uh, and then even though it's not quite as often we can see hurricanes even reach all the way up into new england and then even up into Canada. So like, we just tell everybody, you have to be prepared anywhere along the East Coast, Gulf Coast of the United States, Canada, and then even everywhere in the Caribbean uh, coast as well. All right, thanks, Robbie. Um, I want to this two-part question. I, uh, the first part, I'll let uh, John answer, and then the other ones, I'll let our two WFO folks answer. Uh, the first part is, um, how many tornadoes can you possibly see in a hurricane? Does it vary? Number two is not necessarily for about the hurricanes, is how where in Florida is the most prone area for tornadoes and how busy can it get? Okay, so I'll, go, I'll do the first part, Andy, as you advised. So yeah, how many tornadoes can happen in hurricanes? Well, it varies a lot. And it depends really upon other things going on besides the hurricane. We've seen some hurricanes come ashore and make landfall and only produce a few tornadoes. And then we've seen other hurricanes produce 
50 or so tornadoes all across the country or more. So it varies, varies so much. And one thing to remember though, is that we do know a spot where tornadoes are likely to form in hurricanes. And it's in those rain bands that Robbie was showing earlier, especially on the right side of the hurricane. Thanks, John. Um, I had a question. It's hard to find. There's so many questions on here, but I did have a question about uh, about the weather balloons and uh, about how we launch those, when we launch them, and and what they do for us. So maybe I'll throw that over to uh, Paxton, and then uh, Jennifer can uh, can add on. Yeah. So we do weather balloons. Not every weather service office does a weather balloon. Um, a bulk of them do. Um, Tampa's and one in Florida, Florida that does it as well. Um, but basically we release weather balloons two times a day at a minimum. Um, and the times fluctuate between standard time and daylight savings time. Uh, so depending on what time we're in during the time of year, uh, it's either gonna be at 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. or 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. every single day. Now, if there are hurricanes coming, a lot of times we'll do special releases during the middle of the day, so then models can ingest more data. It helps it helps the hurricane center out a lot. And a lot of times, maybe 99% of the time, it's the hurricane center that actually requests an extra launch. So we'll, we will do that. Um, but attached to weather balloons, we have these little instruments called radio sons. And these radio sons, they measure, um, they measure pressure, uh, the GPS sensor within them, they me that measures the wind. Uh, so depending on where the weather balloon is actually flirting, that gets that general wind speed and wind direction. And they also measure the moisture in the atmosphere. So they'll get the relative humidity and they also grab the temperature as well. And as I mentioned before, all of this data gets put into, into ingested into models. But also we look at what these, the data uh, presents in a, and it creates a sounding, which is a, it's basically a, a graphic of, of the atmosphere and the vertical of what's going on and how dry it is, the instability. It gives meteorologists a lot of detail so we could see what might happen throughout the day. So it definitely helps with the forecasting process. But the United States, we're not the only country that releases weather balloons. They're actually released all around the world. But they're they're pretty they're pretty interesting and the balloons they get pretty big too. Yeah, um, you pretty much covered everything. Um, the only thing I would say also is um, you know we are the the balloon itself and the sensor measures all the way from here at the surface to near the top of the atmosphere. Um, so it's uh, you know the entire flight takes about ninety minutes or so, and we are collecting data. Um, the entire time throughout that 90 minutes. And um, like she said, we then use that data literally every day um, to assess what the atmosphere looks like, how prone is it for thunderstorms to happen, maybe how dry is it, and the potential for um, wildfires to get out of control is there. Um, we get so much useful data out of that, as well as it's um, you know one of the basis for uh, the computer models. So. Um, it is an indispensable tool that we have that we do twice a day. All right, the next question I have is for Nikki. There's been a lot of other questions about the kind of the experience of flying into a hurricane. Uh, like how long is the flight? Uh, can you get up, walk around, eat food? Um, and what tools are used once you get into the hurricane? That's a great question. So it depends on which aircraft you're flying on. So if you're flying on the G4, um, which is the jet that flies a lot higher, Gonzo, um, it's going to be a lot less bumpy because for portions of the flight, um, and I guess that this is not specific to hurricanes, but for other situations, other missions we do, because we don't just we don't just fly into hurricanes, we fly into winter storms, we fly around tornadoes, um, sometimes you're in the stratosphere, so it's a little bit quieter up there, um, but for a hurricane situation, the G4 is also on the quieter side. You'll still get some turbulence, some bumps, um, but you're not as stuck to your seatbelt as you would be with the P3. Um, and the things that you're doing when you're flying on the G4, uh, you're still looking at radar, you're still analyzing uh, what's going on below you, um, but you're also deploying drop sons. So both Paxson and Jen talked a little bit about weather balloons. So a drop wind son is actually kind of the opposite of a weather balloon. 
There are also little instruments that attach to parachutes, and we drop them out of the back of our aircraft. Um, so both our P3 and our G4 will do these types of things, and we'll release maybe 30 drop sons if we're flying a mission. And these drop sons also measure temperature, pressure, wind speed, things like that, that then we process on the aircraft. Now on the P3, there's gonna be a lot more people on board. And the P3 missions, well, all the missions are between like eight to 10 hours. Um, and they're usually flying back to back day and night because if you have a hurricane that's bearing down on the United States or on the Caribbean, we're going to be out there surveying, getting data. So you have a team that flies during the day and then you have a team that flies during the nighttime. So you're constantly on um, an operational shift, ready to go like the rest of the team here. Um, a lot of us work 24, 24 seven. So I guess we're on the aircraft. These guys are on the ground. So we're all working around the clock to protect everybody. Um, and so P3 is also going to be like an eight to 10 hour mission but it's gonna be a lot bumpier. Um, you're not gonna be walking around as much, um, especially once you get to that storm environment. But keep in mind, you're not spending all eight to 10 hours in the storm environment. We actually have to go fly to the storm, you know, do our surveillance in the storm, and then we have to come back home. So you still have two to three hours in transit where you can go use the restroom, go heat up some food in the back, you know, get up and stretch your legs. So um, on the C3, you're also releasing those drop songs. You're still monitoring radar even more, um, you know, because you're kind of going straight through what you're seeing on radar. Um, so your radar uh, meteorologist is definitely staying focused, looking at what's coming up ahead and letting our pilots know, hey, we need to go ahead and go maybe 10 degrees to the east around this thunderstorm or, um, you know, 10 degrees to the west, depending on where that storm is located within the rain bands of the hurricane. Thanks, Vicki. Um, a lot of, uh, again, still a lot of interesting questions uh, coming in. Uh, see others talking about sports teams still, so we got all kinds of fans on. Uh, but one question that that just kind of interesting, it's a little different, not quite uh, fully into the meteorology, but it does talk about uh, whether or not our agencies work with the Coast Guard. And I can start by saying yes, that, you know, we have a unit at the National Hurricane Center that does a lot of marine forecasting, and they do work really cl close with the Coast Guard. Uh, but I was going to throw it again, maybe over to, to Jennifer. Um, I know you at the local forecast office, I mean, you, you all are working with a lot of local and state emergency management agencies, media partners, and others. Does anything stand out about some of that work and how you, again, are helping those uh, folks to prepare? Yeah, so um, we actually do weekly webinars with um, the Coast Guard and other um, partners, such as emergency management, as you said. And um, so we're at least in weekly contact with the Coast Guard. Then if um, we have any type of weather that is expected, severe weather um, or hurricanes, then we are um, briefing them, uh, doing once or twice a day updates as well uh, to them so that they know what to expect so they can keep their crews safe. And as well as um, if they have any missions, then we're going to give them specialized spot forecasts for the area that they're patrolling um, to either do search and rescue or uh, any kind of other uh, specialty mission that they might have. So we work very closely with the Coast Guard. Absolutely. All right, I got another question here um, for the for the specialists, but also I, I'd like to hear the WFO's take of uh, how things change when a hurricane approaches. Um, how many hurricanes can happen all at once for Robbie or John? And like I said, when something approaches the WFO area, how do things change as far as operations are concerned? Yeah, so I'll start out here, I guess. As we talked about earlier at the Hurricane Center, we're not just worried about the Atlantic Ocean. We're also looking at the eastern part of the Pacific Ocean. So there are times where we could have up to six different storms ongoing at the same time. And so we have to make sure that we have enough people on shift to put out the forecast for all those storms. So it can get quite busy, especially if one or more of those storms happens to be hitting land at the same time. So if a storm is staying over the ocean, it's a little bit of an easier forecast uh, because the only hit impacts really that storm's gonna cause are kicking up the waves wherever it's located. People don't care about the rain over the ocean and so forth. But once that storm hits land, uh, then all those hazards come more into play. And then that's when we have to be in coordination with people like Jen and Paxton because they're making the local forecasts at the coast and inland uh, once those storms reach shore. All right, and Jennifer or Paxton? Yeah, so bouncing off with what Robbie said, uh, as the storm approaches land, the staffing strategy starts to change a little bit. Um, it's, it's kind of a fine line of being adequately staffed 
where where we are all effective, uh, balancing that with forecast or fatigue. Uh, because a lot of times when there's a hurricane approaching, we, we flip to 12 hour shifts. And then if it's threatening our general area, we pretty much shelter in place, can't go anywhere. And I mean, a lot of times after you work 12 hours, you just want to go home, but you can't, you have to find a little dark corner in, in the building somewhere to take a nap or whatever. Um, but we have to balance our staffing strategy. And, and if we are short staffed, uh, we get TDYs, uh, which are basically, uh, they're meteorologists from other weather service offices across, across the country that come down and help us. So we have extra bodies on hand and that definitely helps with forecast of fatigue because then you're not constantly at the office. Um, but again, we bounce back, we uh, have ideas, we match our forecast with what the hurricane center is saying and we want to match with what Tampa's, Tampa is saying, what Melbourne saying what all the other WFOs are saying, so everybody's on the same page. So the message stays the same. You don't want to have conflicting messages everywhere. Thanks, Baxton. Um, so we've come up on 12 o'clock, so we're about out of time. I was going to throw maybe one last question around to the uh, panelists, and folks can say their goodbye. And maybe I'll let the uh, Anson. You can see Andy. I'll let Andy wrap things up at the the very end here uh, today. Uh, but I did see a question. I know, Andy, I think you might have answered it on here, but maybe we can expand upon it saying, uh, do we enjoy our jobs? And I'll start and then maybe kind of pass it around and see if you folks already are nodding their heads. But yes, uh, you know, I really enjoy what we do. Um, it's it's from, from myself. It was something that uh, as a child, I really got interested in weather and wanted to make it a career. I never felt like it's uh, that much of a job. It's uh, more of a hobby and passion for me. And the fact that we get to help others, uh, not only across Florida, but across the United States and in the Caribbean, prepare for hurricanes, uh, uh, you know, it makes it that much uh, of a more rewarding experience to, to do. So so that's my uh, my story. I'll sign off and then let, uh, maybe I'll send it over to John and we can send it around and then Andy will sign us off for today. But uh, again, thanks everybody for joining us. So John? Sure. Thanks, Dan. <clears throat> I really enjoy my job, too. You know how I know I enjoy it? I, I still feel lucky to have it, everybody. So sometimes I go to work, I'm like, wow, I get to do this every day, and I feel happy and, and honored to do the job. Um, and I, I think that's the secret, everyone. So when you when you think of what you want to do in your life, um, think of something that you wouldn't mind doing every day. Uh, and I feel lucky enough to have that. So maybe I'll send it now to, to Robbie to add, that, add something to that. Yeah, well, you know, I think for like most of us who are meteorologists now, we knew when we were young that this is what we wanted to do. I mean, I always loved to watch the weather. Even with hurricanes, I used to have a map that I would watch the Weather Channel and see where the hurricanes were located and plot it myself. So uh, even when I was younger, I knew that hurricanes was, whatever, for whatever reason, it fascinated me. Um, so, I, yeah, I do feel lucky to have this job now as a hurricane specialist and uh, you know, grateful that I'm able to do this uh, every day. And I guess now I can send it maybe to Nikki. I'm just going to echo what you guys are saying. Uh, I, I tell my boss all the time, I'm living the dream. Uh, I'm here since the third grade. This is what I wanted to do. And I'm lucky enough to get to do it. And I'm missing seeing my, my colleagues every single day as we are all, you know, working from home right now. Um, a lot of us are trying to telework. Um, but I absolutely love what I do. It puts a smile on my face. And I think a lot of the people I work with probably feel the same way. I guess I'll throw it over to Paxton and Andy's wrapping up. So we'll go from left to right. Yeah, I, in agreement with everybody, I absolutely love my job. I'm from South Florida, so it's great to be able to be back home, um, knowing the area already. And I mean, it, it's fun. And there's times when we don't have, the weather is really bad, really severe. You get sad news out of it, but at the end of the day, we still we did our jobs. There's more success stories than than tragedies, and being able to help people to to succeed in our mission, it's it's a rewarding feeling, but it's also a great feeling too. Yeah, so I guess I'm uh, next, but um, same 
as what everybody's kind of saying is I one of my very earliest memories uh, I was about five years old when Hurricane Elena brushed our coastline and sitting in my house you know watching out the window as uh, you know the rain was pouring down and wind was blowing everything around it, one of my earliest memories is of weather and so yeah absolutely love what I do I'm also from the Tampa Bay area um, so just like Paxton you know it, it's great to be home it's great to be able to um, keep my fellow residents safe and um yeah just love what i do always uh, have had an interest and yeah that's about it what's funny jennifer is that actually hurricane Elena is what got me interested in uh, tropical weather as well and i lived in pinellas county and i was i was uh, 85 so i was uh just turned six um so yeah having the passion for meteorology doing something you have the passion for and feeling like you're making a difference doing it it's kind of the theme going around through all of us here. Um, I One question we've had a lot of, and Robbie, I'll let you answer it real quick. We'll post this to YouTube afterwards. Can you recommend a way to search for it so they can easily find it? Yeah, so the webinar that we just conducted, we'll be uploading it to YouTube by the end of the week. So you can go to our YouTube channel, the Hurricane Center. It's youtube.com slash NWSNHC. Uh, so go to that website to get the our YouTube channel, and you'll be able to find uh, this particular webinar and actually other webinars that we've conducted in the past as well. All right. Thanks, Robbie. Well, thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and sign out myself. Everybody else can say bye afterwards as well. Um, thank you for joining us. Uh, you have a good rest of your day. Bye, everybody. Take care, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye.